Hello and welcome to the workshop where today we're focused in on weathering, which is a great subject, a great passion of mine and yours. Um, interesting, we use completely different techniques, but in this part we're going to be looking at wagon weathering specifically. Absolutely. So Mike and myself are going to run through a few different techniques. I'm going to be using enamel sprays and powders, whereas Mike likes to use acrylics. Because yeah, because yeah, they dry quicker and I can do things more quickly. I've never got enough time to do what I want to do. Well, look, the advantage there is if you've got loads of wagons or coaches to, to paint in, in one day, for example, then and I suppose acrylics is really good, whereas enamels do take time to dry. If you want to take your time with modeling, as we said, everything is different. Yeah. And the other thing I think to mention here as well, actually, is even though we both use different materials, actually, you can use both acrylics and enamels on the same vehicles as well. You don't have to be exclusive to one type of product or another. You Absolutely. Can use powders as well. There's loads of different techniques you can bring. So you can use handwork, you can use um, powder weathering, you can do airbrushing. All these can, things can be combined to create a finished weathered model. That's right. And the thing is, what I typically find is people are very scared to start weathering. So what we're going to do in this particular series, we're starting with wagons to show you something simple, how you can basically start knowing nothing at all and work up from a brand new model into something that looks well weather worn and beaten really exactly, as, yeah. as weathering basically is. That's right and I think uh, one of the things that anyone tends to advise on weathering is actually to start with something that actually you're not too bothered about. It's like go to a second hand store at the Model Railway Show, yeah. find something cheap, find a two pound wagon. Doesn't matter if it's got no wheels or anything like that. It, it's just something for you to practice the techniques on. Um, have a go out, learn the ropes of what the materials do, how they flow into different panel lines and things like that. And mm -hmm. um, before you start picking up your nice, shiny, expensive model that you might have bought and might have treasured. That's right. And actually, I did. I actually did the very same thing. I bought a very. I think it was one of those lifelike. Um, Hopper wagons, an American thing. And on each panel, I just tried different powders, acrylic, enamels. I also tried different varnishes, so gloss, satin, matte, just so you could see the difference and then how they interacted with the paints and powders. So, as Mike said, buy something cheap and nasty to just practice on is always the best way to start because you do not want to spend 50 pounds or 100 pounds on a piece of rolling stock and botch it really exactly that's right and i think the other thing, interesting thing with that is actually i had um, a spare body shell that i'd use for what i referred to as target practice for, for trialing some different paints for airbrushes um, and ironically it's now one of the nicest weathered logos i've got what i did is I actually went back to it years later and i pulled back all the weathering and bad painting on it um, and took that all back and it all sat in the panel joints and the grill details and everything actually it's made a really nice weathered model at the end of it See, there you go, you just heard there. So if you make a mistake, you can always rectify it. And what we're going to do with this particular series is give you the confidence to make a start, or if you've done some weathering, improve those skills even further to get you into the next level. So we're pretty much ready to get started now and start actually showing you some of the techniques. But I think before that, we need to talk about actually what weathering is. Because I think sometimes people might think it's just making things dirty. That's um, right. But I think actually the techniques are much more subtle than that. So actually, ironically, I like doing a clean locomotive which sounds really odd because they're all clean, aren't they, when they come out of the box? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's clean and then there's work clean, of course. So exactly. the way that weathering was once described to me was it should be subtle where you say to somebody, it's weathered, and they go, oh, yeah, it is. It's not meant to be over the top yeah. as such. But it also depends on what you want. If you're going for a sort of 1960s end of steam, heavily run down look, obviously the weathering will be more heavy to match that particular time. Whereas if it's work clean, you've got things like a gloss satin boiler, for example, a little bit of oil coming off the cylinders, a little bit of surface rust here and there, but nothing where it looks like it's been in the scrapyard for 10 years. Exactly, like the, the classic oily rag finish of the cleaners have been around the loco, prepped it for its day, or maybe it's not long been out of works, whatever it may be. Absolutely. But it's, it's quite easy to replicate those effects as well with a model locomotive. And just to tone down the factory finish, to take it from being what is overly pristine in terms of when it comes out of a box versus what it would look like in any scenario. It's like if you look at a locomotive when it comes even literally straight out of works, by the time they put a fire in it, it'll have a dribble of dirt here and there. It'll That's have right. had a bit of um, soot coming out of the chimney. So everything starts to change colour and have have different um, textures come to it. It's almost straight away as soon as it's got a fire in a steam locomotive. Oh, um, definitely. And oil starts to drip out everywhere and it, it's always got something. Yeah, that's always right. got something. Exactly. The other thing which we want to do is also dispel a few of the weathering cliches as such. Like, for example, my my pet hate is when you see people weathering steam engines and every single washout plug has got white coming out of it, which never ever happened. Steam engines didn't have lime scale out of every single washout plug because if they were all leaking, well, that's that's not a very good steam locomotive. No. So we're going to dispel a few of those cliche myths as well and just talk to you about the subtleties of weathering and how it can be achieved. We're also going to take you through some of the basic techniques as well in this series. Indeed. We're going to start with wagons and of course with wagons there's quite a few. So there's your mineral wagons, your plank wagons, box wagons and of course tankers as well. 
Absolutely. So there's quite a few varieties that we can show you how to do each one because they all look different in service. That's right, exactly. And in further parts of this series as well, we're going to go on to look at locomotive weather. We've got a really nice pair of 9S lined up for that. I'm really um, looking, looking forward to that. Totally different finishes on them as well. And um, we've got some carriage weathering planned as well. So your classic carriage rake, how can you actually make a rake of vehicles look uh, look like they belong together, but not mm. too similar at the same time. Uh, and we're also going to have some diesel locomotive weathering as well, but it's all going to be focused on 1960s period stock for this particular series. However, we have got future series planned on weathering as well, which will cover different areas of the sector as well. Absolutely. So, look, I think we just get into it and start with some wagon weathering. Yes, over to you and some mineral wagons. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through how to weather a basic mineral wagon. Now, this is what we're trying to achieve over here. This is just your standard Barkman 16 ton mineral wagon, which I have weathered using literally everything over here. And that is rail match sleeper grind. And this is enamel paint that comes in a spray that you can also buy it in uh, tins that you can use it with an airbrush if you wish. Thinners, and you'll see why we use that later on, uh, because we're going to cover everything, and I do mean everything, and the thinners are a must. Once that is dry, I like to use the Humbrol Aging Powders Pack, because there's a whole bunch of different rust shades over this, which really brings out the detail. And last but not least, we all need a brush, a cotton bud, and some matte varnish to seal everything in. So to achieve a look like this is not hard at all. The secret to weathering this and anything is to take your time and to reference something. What I would highly recommend is looking at books or visiting a heritage railway and having a look at the rolling stock and paying close attention to the body sides, the underframe, see where the dirt kicks up. If one of these was carrying coal, for example, well, how dirty do they get inside? How dirty do they get outside? Where does the rust form? It's the subtlety which makes all the difference in the weathering. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these brand spanking new, very clean wagons and we're going to make this look similar to this. Let's make a start. So first and foremost, always make sure that you are working in a very well ventilated environment. Over here we have our extractor fan. If you are working outdoors, you don't need anything like this, but make sure that you can always breathe and that you have got absolute proper protection because you don't want to be breathing in that horrible stuff. It's always good to have a weathering turntable, whether it be an elevator one like this or the small uh, cake one. It just depends on what scale and gauge you're working in. But that is good because you don't want to be picking up a wet model with your hands. Once we put the model on there, we can start with our first step, which is to spray the entire thing with the rail match sleeper grime. The other thing, of course, is make sure you give these things a really good shake. That's important. Now I'm sure that there's a few of you out there going, what are you doing? Don't worry about it. Yes, it now looks as if it's been covered in absolute mud. I'm gonna leave that now for five minutes just so that the paint starts to take on the model and then we're gonna basically take off most of it with our thinners. Now we've waited about five minutes or so, the room here is actually nice and warm so that's baking on very, very well. And now we're gonna take most of all that off with the Humbrol enamel thinners. And of course you use enamel thinners with enamel paint and acrylic thinners with acrylic paint. It's important to know that difference. Now, I always use a cotton bud because it absorbs a liquid, it lasts really well and it doesn't, it doesn't leave a lot of residue on the model. You don't want to have brush marks or anything like that. This is actually quite good and let's face it, they're cheap and you can buy hundreds of them. So simply dip this into your thinners like so, and we start to take the sleeper grime back. And you can see here that the paint is staying in the areas where the cotton bud doesn't reach. And that's what you want, because you want to make sure that you are basically taking out the major sections, but the thinners make everything else stay there so it just looks like natural dirt, the way that it would actually form. So you can see here, it looks a little bit streaky, It'll dry like that, but we can also turn that down with the powders. But you can see that around the top over here and the sides, it's still quite prominent. That's the look that you want to go for rather than a look like this where it's completely and utterly caked on. 
And of course, once you've done one side, you turn it around and you do the other side exactly the same way. So like I said, you don't need to be too careful in the way that you do this. Just put it on and let it all just drip off. The good thing with the thinners is it will take the paint and practically wash it all away. And you can see here we're literally taking off about 80% or 85% of all the paint. But it's just leaving everything looking dirty, muddy, murky. If you wanted to and think oh, it's a bit too thick down the bottom, you can always just take some of that off and then run your cotton bud with the thinners on it across again just to keep everything nice and uniform and straight. So you can really see there that that's taking. The bonus to this, of course, is the underframe is also now full of sleeper grime paint. So when it comes to detailing, you've already got that nice weathered look to your frame and your wheels and your brake rigging. Do the same thing on the ends. Now, the ends of wagons and vans and even tenders, they always seem to get a bit more dirty than the sides. So you can afford to leave these a bit more built up if you want to. There's no rules to this, it just comes down to what you want to do, but as I say, reference photographs all the time and look at items of rolling stock on Heritage Railways. When it comes to this end, this is where you can actually be a bit more creative. Because you've got the doors here that open up, it doesn't need to look as clean as the rest of it. So I always like to leave this end a fraction more filthy. And get in there and just make it random. So you can just dab this around a little bit rather than doing it up and down. Just randomize it so it it looks real because you've got a lot of different angles over here, you've got the handles and everything else. You want this to look a bit different, a bit more filthy. And there we go. So that is step number one complete now. You can see here that you can, we've brought back the original colour of the plastic underneath the weathering and that's what you want. You don't want everything to look totally filthy. We can build the layers up and the good thing with the spray is we've also got some overspray on the inside of the wagon here as well. That's going to come in real handy when we do the interior later on. What I do now is I leave that to dry. Because we've used a lot of thinners, you'll actually find the paint here won't take very long to dry at all. If it's a cold day, it might take an hour or so. To properly dry completely, of course, will take at least a day. But we just leave that here now, let the thinners do its thing, and then we can start part two, which is adding the detail with the powders. So you can see here that now that this is dry, you can see how I've achieved this particular look because if we if we look close up over here you can definitely see where that first coat of sleeper grime is still in the top under the edge over here in the corners and around the door and exactly the same thing is replicated just over here on our new model that we're just starting now so you can see why this base coat is so important the next step is to use the weathering powders to bring out different shades and different details. Now, my go-to powders are the excellent Humbro range, which were also available from the Key Model World shop, which is at keymodelworld.com forward slash shop. We're gonna have some fantastic packs for you to buy to have a go at this yourself. But the one that I like using the most for this is the Aging Powders Pack. Now, this comes with light rust, medium rust, dark rust, black smoke, and iron oxide. And we have them all down here. Now, this is a word of warning. Never go overboard with the rust because iron oxide, the light rust, the medium rust, they are actually very heavy shades. You'd be surprised at just how strong those colors really are. So when you use them, make sure you use them sparingly. This is where it's really important to actually have a look at the prototype, whether that be in real life or photographs, see where the rust accumulated. And rust isn't always just one color either. So pay good attention to that, but use those pigments and colors very sparingly. To start with, I like to go on with the Humbrol Black. Now, once again, don't use too much of it. Get yourself a brush that you don't use for painting because these do get ruined quite easily. So get your brush and we'll start putting the black on this side. What I like to do is start up the top and always brush down. If you think of the way that things work in the real world, when it rains, for example, rain comes down, it doesn't come from the side. So of course, when there's any dust and so forth and marks and rust and everything, it will always streak downwards. So start from the top and work your way down. And you can already see here how I've started here. It's nice and heavy under the lip where the rain and wind wouldn't really get to it. And it starts to get lighter from the bottom. And just repeat that process throughout the entire wagon. 
But at the same time, don't do the entire wagon looking exactly the same panel to panel. You want to have variety. You want it to look different. Because you don't want to stand back and do three of these or five of these or ten of these and then have them look exactly the same. The other thing on these wagons, you got these doors over here. And just say, for example, this one does carry coal. Well, these doors will be a lot more dirty than the rest of the body. So keep things like that in mind as well. As you're going along, you might think to yourself, oh, look, you know, I'm putting a little bit too much on or I haven't put enough on here. Don't worry because, once again, this is just the first base. I always use black to start with and then I add the colours on top of that. So we can see here, I'm just going to put a little bit more up the top. And just work it into these corners and then bring it down. But that already is looking really, really good. We can still see all the sleeper grime paint that we left there before. We can see it in the corners. And it also just helps the weathering patterns to stick to the model because it's not clean plastic. It just adheres really, really well. So what we'll do now is we'll just do exactly the same thing on all three sides and then we'll change our colours. I do recommend using one colour first and moving forward with other colours after that. So now that we've gone over the entire wagon with the black powder, I like to go over with either the dark earth powder, which you can get separately, or the dark rust powder. But because these ones are a bit stronger, you'll have to start using these sparingly now because whilst I'm mixing with the black really well, too much can be overpowering. Think of putting chocolate sauce on a white top. That's what that's going to look like. So let's make a start on that. So you can see here that I'm just going over just a little bit of the sides on the black just to bring it down because in the real world black is never black. There are different shades. There's, there's muddy black, there's oily black, there's rusty black, there's grey black. So black is never ever black. But you can see here just how strong the pigments are. If, if you just have a look in over here you can definitely see where these shades are coming through. We don't want to do the entire wagon because otherwise it's just not going to look realistic. The whole thing with weathering, it's, it's just like any form of painting. It's adding a little bit here and a little bit there and blending it together so that when you look at the entire finished product, it looks real. And that's what we're aiming for, subtle. And once again, we'll do the same thing on all four sides of the wagon. I like to make sure I'm doing around the doors. We'll do the frame and everything afterwards, as I said before. Just bring it down once again in just in vertical streaks, just here and there, just so you're really starting to highlight this little bit of brown over the black. Sometimes the thing with weathering is you'll get to a certain stage and you'll take a break and you'll come back and look at it and you think, I've, I've messed up, I haven't got this right yet. Keep going. If you get to this stage and you're not impressed, there's no need to take off and start again because you might find that by adding different shades, you could finally end up with a result that you go, actually, that's pretty good. So just keep going. It's also good just to go over your buffers as well because buffers are seldomly clean and the same thing with couplings I always tend to find that people ignore the couplings if you look at couplings on heritage rolling stock even the, the preserved stock couplings are never clean and they're never 
one color either. They can be black, they can be brown, they can be metal. So always make sure that you go over that detail as well. So this is now starting to look like a really nice weathered vehicle. In fact, we could almost leave it there and just start to work on the frame. But when you consider that these things are outdoors all the time, if you're putting coal into it and out of it, after a while the coal chips the paint, it exposes the bare metal, and when bare metal hits the environment and it rains, and then the sun comes out and the wind comes out and it rains again and the process repeats, rust starts to form. And it can form between the doors, it can form on the sheet metal, it can form almost anywhere where there's been liquid followed by oxygen. So I would definitely like to go in there now and just add a few small subtle highlights of rust. And I like to make sure in this particular pack I typically use the light rust and the medium rust because iron oxide it's a bit too red and I typically find that it's just a fraction too overpowering. So we'll just go with a light and medium rust and just give a few highlights to the body. What I tend to do with the rust is I start with the, the darker colour and then I go to the light one afterwards. There's no right or wrong way for doing that, that's just my technique. You can do it backwards if you want to, but I like to go darker to light. Make sure you only put a little bit of this stuff on your brush, because if you put too much on, you're going to regret it. Now, for example, I would say that the rust would start to form around the base of the door on the hinges. A really good tip when it comes to putting rust on is to, rather than paint it, just dab the brush, like stipple the brush as such, because that way you'll get a more randomised look to it, and you're not going to get vertical streak marks. So always just dab the brush on. Just a little bit here, just on things like the hinges. You can afford to also just, as you do this, just sort of blow it very gently. And don't go overboard, don't put rust on every single hinge, because like we said in the introduction, it's like with steam engines. You never got lime scale out of every single wash-up plug. You don't put rust on every single hinge. I like to put a little bit on the bodywork as well, just here and there, just a little bit. You don't want to go overboard with this at all. So if you just dab it on, and then just give it a, a light streak down. Dab some into the corners. As I say, this is all about being subtle. So you can see here, we've just got a little bit of rust. It's not overpowering, but it just gives that more three-dimensionality to our model now. Okay, so we're almost finished the body now. I don't actually think I need to put any light rust on this. I'm just going to leave it as the medium rust because I think that looks light enough. But what I want to do now is just bring out a little bit more detail in the black. And this is where I'm going to bring my smoke out. Once again, use this one sparingly. This is grey and it can totally change the entire look of what you've just done. But it does help to just tone down a little bit of the black and a little bit of the, the dark earth. So just bring that in ever so slightly, just to once again, just give a little bit of variation. It also helps to tone down the rust ever so slightly. You don't need a lot of this, just a little bit. And once again, just go over all sides, just here and there. And you can see here the streak marks slowly coming in. Just a little bit of smoke. Smoke, I think, is actually one of the best powders. You can use it on roofs, you can use it on steam engine boilers. It's just a wonderful, wonderful shade. And it just helps to just bring everything down so, so much. Right, what I do now is I put a little bit of smoke on my frame. We've already got our frame dirt on there, but it's just nice to just run that right underneath the body into the frame itself. And this is where you can just go to town as such. You can go through the springs, the horns, the brake rigging, just to start to bring out the highlights. I always use smoke for the frames, and then I'll turn it down a bit later with the, the dark earth again, and then I'll add some rust to some of the brake rigging, the brake blocks and so forth. I always use smoke for the base, just a little bit to highlight a few areas. Do the same thing here with the other side. And like I said at the beginning, this is fun, like you can just be very creative with this. It's just good to just try different looks. Don't try to make one side look the same as the other side. And just mix it in gently. I'm quite happy with that. So that's enough for the smoke. I'll now bring out our dark earth once again. 
and turn that down a little bit. Once again, with the dark earth, just go sparingly because this does have a very strong pigment and you don't want to be overpowering with the brown. But you can see there just by mixing that in, that now looks, it looks like it's faded, it looks like it's dirt, you've got some rust around there, you've got some highlights. It's now starting to look really good. It, it actually looks like it's been around for the past 20 years and never been overhauled once. We didn't decide on this, this is just the way I'm feeling at the time. You can go light, you can go heavy, but this one is obviously heavy. Okay, now the final thing I'm going to do for the sides of the body on the outside is the brake rigging and the brake blocks. Now the brake blocks, if you look at them, they're usually always very bright because they get used all the time, they heat up, they cool down, they get probably the most rusty of anything underneath any item of rolling stock. So I'm going to take my medium rust again and I'm just going to once again dab it onto the brake blocks just to really get that nice rusty dirty look on the blocks. You will find of course that the wheels will get a bit of rust them and that's okay because you can blend the colors a little bit later on but you can just see here that those brake blocks are now highlighted just a little bit and it brings out all the detail when you watch the wagon going along you'll be able to see the brake blocks see the wheels see the rigging the entire wagon comes to life right so we've now finished all the exterior of the wagon and I think when you compare it to a brand new one it looks pretty damn good, doesn't it? As you can see, there's not a huge amount of technicality in this process. It's basically put it on, take it off, and then just taking your time. It doesn't take long to get a very good, realistic look out of what you're doing. But to finish everything off, I do want to achieve a look like this inside. Now, some people like to fill their wagons with coal or, or something else. Maybe it could be some wood or other things that are being carried. But it's also nice to see empty wagons. But you don't want to just have an empty wagon with no detail and you also don't want to have an empty wagon with just one colour of rust. Like I said before, the colour of rust is different shades. There's light, there's dark, there's medium, there's orange, there's burnt, there's so many different shades of rust. So I'm going to show you how we now replicate this. It's quite simple. So for the inside, I like to use smoke as my base. Black is just a little bit too dark for the interior. So get yourself the smoke and pour it all the way in. Now when it comes to your base coat you can afford to just brush it in. It doesn't matter how you do it, you can make any random action you want. You can go up, you can go down, you can swirl it from side to side. The important thing is just to get it all in there and cover all the corners, all the sides and all the base. And once we have the base shade in there we go through with all that different other colors and just just dab it back in again. Never go up and down again. Always just dab it in to get that rusted look because rust always looks like it's just been dotted on.
So it's great to see the finished results of this, and actually I think it looks superb. I've learnt a few things today. I mean, I'll, I'll be quite honest, I'm not the best at weathering steel-bodied mineral wagons, but I, I've got some techniques now I can take home and use myself. Well, look, I look forward to seeing your results, and one of the things that I found really worked for me, apart from just looking at the real world and archival photographs, is asking other modellers, how did you achieve that look? What did you use? What are your techniques? And that's how we learn. Modelling isn't meant to be a secret. The more that you ask or the more you watch videos such as like this, you just learn different things. So I'm really happy that you can now go off and do this yourself. That's right. So with the, well, that's one out of the rake of 21. So I'll leave you to get cracking with the rest of those. And uh, I'm going to move on and show people some new techniques now, which is to how to weather weathered wood on bolster wagons. So some steel carrying wagons with a bit of under frame detail as well. So we've followed Jonathan's technique for the steel body mineral wagons and what I thought I'd do is show you one of my actually one of my favourite techniques I think for weathering goods wagons which is add to, a, to add a weathered wood finish uh, to the top deck of things like bolster wagons and flat wagons. Um, I've already followed a little bit of a similar process for the underframe so there are a quick spray over of the rail match sleeper grime I've then taken some of that back a little bit with a cotton bud so following a very similar process uh, and now the whole deck is going to be finished using dry brushing and acrylics so uh, there's a whole series of weathered wood paints available in the life colour paint range uh, they're really easy to work with they dry in minutes and it means you can keep adding layers on top of each other to build the depth um, towards the end of the process we'll add some extra colours over the top using some powders as well just to tie all those together uh, but all you really need for this is once you've done your basic weathering is a simple paintbrush a piece of kitchen towel and the paint colours you're going to use so as you can see straight out of the box these decks they're quite bland really just a, a single colour finish to them which is nothing like what real wood would weather like in the real world uh, you see lots of different colours coming through it's the knots you see the staining uh, we'll be able to recreate all that with these acrylic paints. So with any acrylic paints, like any paints, it's really important to give them a really good shake or stir before you use them if you don't want any lumps of paint coming through. Now we're only really going to be using really small quantities of this and it's, we're going to start with a, a medium sort of almost gingery coloured wood finish uh, for this. Um, what I tend to do as well is because I want such small quantities, rather than picking the paint about the bottom of the pot, uh, pick it up from the middle of the, the lid instead. Um, and I want just such a small amount on the brush and I'm going to wipe probably 50% of that off onto the paper towel uh, and then it's a case of working just gradually across the surface of this you're not looking to paint it as such so much as just add a bit of a stain to the colour of the uh, the wagon deck so it's a little bit of a fiddly process and you keep picking up bits of paint brushing it on working it around the deck you can go back to the paint as you build up more on the paper towel as well you'll find you have some there you can use as well um, I mean, in here today is quite warm, so these are going off pretty quickly. I mean, I could already be adding a second coat to these if I wanted to. Again, we talked about this with the steel mineral wagon. We talked about the direction of weathering. You know, you've got to think with, with timber that timber tends to have a longitudinal grain. So on something like a, a, a bolster wagon like this, the, the grain's going to be going left to right across the wagon. It's going to, going to go up and down the length of it because um, the, the planks are going left to right. Uh, so you want to be mirroring that effect with that with these paints as well. Just gradually building up the paint colour. Like I say, we're not looking to paint these, uh, so you don't just want to slosh a load of brown colour on and walk away. It's also important with each colour as well, you actually spread them around and blend them. So you can see that that first colour is now done. It's now not had a huge impact on the total colour of the wagon, uh, but there is now a discoloration to those original uh, factory coloured planks. Uh, but this is just stage one. So I'm going to work my way across the, the rest of the wagon now, get all this deck done with this initial colour, and then we'll move on to the next one. One of the things I would say as well is, is don't worry too much if you do get a bit too much paint on uh, or you feel like it's gone a bit heavy or, or got towards being actually painted uh, because by the time we've done all the extra layers on this you won't notice anyway. It's one of those perfectly imprecise ways of painting vehicles. So I've literally I've just done it here, I've put way too much paint on here. But it's not the end of the world.
I've got the first colour now onto the deck of the Bolster Wagon. You see there's quite a difference already between the two vehicles here. One having the, the factory finish, the darker brown, and this one having the, the slightly lighter tone to it. Um, one application of wood coloured paint though isn't going to make a, the real difference I want it to have at the end of the process. So what we're doing now is use sparingly three other colours, but they're all going to be dry brushed, so very much in the same way, but even smaller amounts this time. Uh, so I'm going to start next with this warm wood light shade, which is it's quite a, a yellowy tinge to it. Uh, it's a bit like more like fresh wood coming off a, a, um, out of a timber mill. And then I've got a, a cold wood light shade, uh, which is, is, is pretty much white. Uh, but think about where like wood gets like sun bleached. It, it tends to go in that kind of whitey colour. Uh, and I've also got a much darker um, warm wood dark shade as well, um, which I just used in places just to blend things together. Uh, and the other thing we can do as well is I might actually do one of, one of the planks completely in the warm wood light shade too, uh, because that will make it look like it's had a new plank put into the body as well. So this is all now about building up successive layers of paint. None of these is going to be a finished layer if you like. Um, they're all going to have extra layers put over the top of them. We can keep blending things together. So if you do make a mistake or you find one bit's got too heavy or too light application, you can go back and add other layers over the top to soften them or blend them together a bit better. Now, generally I'm working across the wagon uh, to follow those plank lines and to give us the, the wood grain effect. Uh, but just around the corner sometimes you need to do a little bit of stippling or, or just side to side motion to bring that together. And again, you can see I'm picking up such tiny quantities of the paint here. You know, there's no brush falls going on here. Okay, so we're now ready to start putting the, the third colour onto this as well now. Uh, so this is the cold wood light shade. Uh, so it's, it's, it's basically white um, and very much a sparing application of this. It's just got to be literally dusted across the top. It's very easy to get too much of this on it, to be quite honest, but it's, it's one of those things where we can just take it back later if we want to. And all I'm trying to do with this is to highlight the fact that there's grain in the wood. So out of all the colours I've used, it's probably the easiest one to overdo it with. Um, but again, I'm not worried about it. I've probably overdone it in three or four places along the wagon at the moment. Uh, but I can bring all that back together with another darker colour on top of it as well. Right, so light colour's done. I've got again another very sparing application, but now the darkest colour I've got here, which is called a warm wood dark shade. So this is now about trying to blend things together again. So we've 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 got all those nice tones in the uh, in the colours we've put down so far, but they're just a little bit stark. And by the time we've done this, we'll probably have four or five layers of paint over the top of this wagon. And you can just see if you look closely at this now that actually, as I brush this dark colour on. It's keeping all the light colours underneath, but it's it's just joining them together nicely. Leaving those hints. 
but not overpowering them. So we're actually going to go back to the original shade that I first picked up to work across the wagon. Uh, we've got two or three colours now, have all been blended together, we've got lots of nice different textures and, and colours coming through on this, uh, but it's important to keep tying them together. Uh, I always feel with this, this process that actually it's, it's, it's keep adding successive layers until you're happy with it. Um, at the moment I'm not happy with it, so therefore I'm going to add a little bit more colour onto it just to finish it off. So the process is always the same, tiny amounts of paint, dry brushing across the deck, and just adding highlights now to those, those colours that have already mixed together. So hopefully by the time we get to the end of this we'll have a nice naturally weathered look to the uh, timber deck on this bolster wagon. But nothing will stand out too much against each other. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty much I'm happy now with how the deck's looking overall, um, but it's now uh, just to tie it all together and finish it off, it needs a little bit of powder weathering as well. So I'm going to turn to the Humbral Smoke colour. I'm going to start working that along the edges of the bolster wagon. I don't want it to go everywhere, it just needs to be subtly applied around the edges, uh, and that just finish it off and blend all the details together. So I'm really going for small amounts of this weathering powder now and just uh, working around specific areas of the wagon. see instantly on this this first panel here now how the the gray of the smoke weathering powder is just it's just taking all the harshness of all the colors from the edges of the wagon away imagine that you know you, you would on a wagon like this you'd have a lot of dirt communicating around the edges and because this is a much more delicate process in terms of blighting this powder I've actually put a little bit onto the the cap rather than going straight out of the pox it's, it's it would be quite easy with this to dunk your brush in pull too much out and you just end up with powder everywhere where you didn't want it. So I've pretty much finished now on the bodywork of the bolster wagon. So I'm going to just add a little bit more texture and detail to the underframe as well. It's just a little bit too subtle probably in terms, well too basic really in terms of actually the weathering application. I'm going to start with the wilder old grease effect which I'm just going to put onto the axle boxes. Just gives a little bit of colouring and staining to those. Again same kind of thing, a little bit out into the top of the uh, weathering pot there. And then just working it around the axle boxes. Okay, it's a very subtle colour this, but it's just one of those subtle colours that does make a difference. Instead of it having just a pure brown colour to these uh, wagons, it's going to have the nice sort of greasy, dirty um, grey around them as well.
just rubbing that dirty grease along the uh, surface of the uh, chassis as well. Just adds a little bit more texture to it as well and highlights some of the details. So one of the things I like to do as well is I tend to find with, with welding you get little deposits of, of dirty powders on your workbench and sometimes the colours they actually do by blending together the different bits of colour that you've used can be a quite nice just to brush together over the top of things just again it's about blending those different colours together not about adding an actual colour to it just blending again. Okay, so that's it. So that's how I add the weathered wood finish to the top deck of a, a planked body wagon like this. Um, hopefully you like the result as well. Really simple to do with some dry brushing and, and powder work on there as well. So you don't need some really expensive equipment either. Right, time to find another project, I think. Well, I must say, I'm actually really impressed how that weathered wood look has actually turned out. I've often heard about it and seen it, but to actually watch you do it, I'm actually really impressed. It's, it's quite simple. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with the outcome, but you still haven't finished those 21 ton mineral wagons yet. Right. Well, look, I tell you, while I uh, while I have a look at that, um, how about you do some more weathering? And um, we've done a wagon, we've done a bolster. How about a tank? Yep, we can do that. Uh, I'll take you through a process, show you how we do it with some simple techniques. So it's now time for our third wagon project for this piece, where we're going to focus on this. TTA tanker. So the first of these were actually introduced at the very end of the BR steamer in the late 1960s. So we're going to add a nice finishing touch to this because it's a little bit fresh out of the box at the moment. It's pristine black. So essentially we're going to follow a similar method to what we use for the mineral wagon to start with. You would use a rail match weathered black spray to go over the whole wagon and then we're going to work that all down with the thinners with a cotton bud again to streak and add some detail to that as well. After that, we can add the extra pieces like the oil staining to it, kind of some chassis weathering as well. We'll end up with a really realistic weathered wagon to go into our train. So first things first, we need to get this paint ready, give it a shake and apply it over the wagon. So we've got the wagon set up on the turntable again. So this gives us easy access to be able to rotate the wagon around whilst we're painting without having to handle it again. So it's just a case of adding a spray of the weathered black over the top of the model. And it's not gonna look great when we first do it. It's just gonna look like we put weathered black paint all over the tanker wagon, but don't worry, we'll take that back and give it a realistic finish. So we've given the tanker a coat of the weathered black now. Uh, that's going to have to be left to dry for a few minutes just to let it harden a little bit. It needs to be fully hard for this next step of the process. After which we'll be able to go over it with the cotton buds, start taking back that paint and giving it a much more realistic street weathered finish. So I'm actually thinking that whilst we've got the weathered black on, we can also add the sleeper grime to the underframe at the same time. Now, one of the techniques I use a lot with airbrushing is to use a business card uh, as a mask. And literally what I do is hold the business card across in front of the wagon, because uh, we're not looking for a perfect sprayed finish on this. It's not like when you're painting a vehicle where you want an exact finish on it. Um, that will give us a soft edge, but it also means we don't end up with loads of sleeper grime all the way up the tanker body as well. So I'm literally just going to hold that across in front of the wagon there and drift in a little bit of sleeper grime from underneath. And you can see instantly it's hitting the chassis, but it's not hitting much of the body at the same time. We do the same around the ends, just holding the mask across the end. Keep turning our wagon round. So now I've got those two basic colours on. Uh, as you can see, actually the business card processes work quite well because the, the, the frame dirt stops at the bottom of the tank barrel and the weathered black comes down from the top at the same time. Now, it's a very crude method, but it's a simple method and it works. I've used that many, many times in my weathering. Uh, it's a little bit easier to control. Well, actually, it's a lot easier to control when you're using an airbrush because you've got much more control over the flow of paint with an airbrush as well. So that with that business card mask, you can actually get some really neat effects with that when you're doing airbrush weathering. But we'll come on to that later in this series. Now though, it's time to start pulling back these paints using the cotton bud dipped in thinners and start giving it a much more realistic weathered finish. So I'm using the humbral thinners again. 
just going to moisten the cotton bud. Actually, you'll notice as well, I'm using a dirty cotton bud as well. I'm not worried about it being a pristine one. We are weathering at the end of the day. So I can just use that to now start bringing down the, the paint that we put on before. Uh, again, thinking like we did with the mineral wagon, it's about these vertical streaks coming down from the top. And we're leaving behind some of the paint, but you know, it's going to create a much nicer effect than the plain aer aerosol applied paint we just put on a minute ago. So I've done my first run over with the uh, thinners on the cotton bud. I'm just going to let that dry for a few minutes and see how it turns out. If I need to take a little bit more off, I can go back over it again with some more thinners and just to, to soften back that weathering effect. And I think the nice thing already, particularly on this side, is you can see that we've still got the streaking of the weathered black paint on there, but it's not heavy, it's not overstated, uh, which is really what I wanted. I mean, this is a, a steam error. This is going to be quite a new vehicle at the end of the day. So it doesn't want to be really filthy. It would, however, pretty much within a week have gathered some road dirt, a bit of fuel staining from the top where it's been filled with oil and fuels as well. Um, so we want to replicate all those little details. So one of the things I am going to do is I'm just going to work over the uh, vehicle numbers, which would often be cleaned by the staff uh, to make sure people can see what vehicle number it was, uh, and particularly where there's hazard warnings as well. And those might be cleaned by hand, so you might find there's slightly cleaner patches where they appear. So to get a, a more subtle effect to the uh, body size, what I've done is I've, I've gone over them a couple of times with the um, cotton buds, but it's then it's, it just wasn't quite giving me the effect I wanted. But then by going over with them again and then using the towel to go over it, it's given me a, a wider surface area to actually reduce the number of individual streaks that are running through the paint, um, which for me has given us a much better finish on this wagon as well. Before, it was just looking a little bit too busy. There's, there's too many streaks going off. The paint wasn't quite coming back how I wanted it to, uh, and it, it lacked a little bit of, of, of finesse, I suppose. Um, I've left the ends fairly well weathered. Um, what I might do just now is actually just, just give these numbers again another little polish as well. Make it look like the, uh, the crew have looked after it. Uh, and then we're pretty much at a point where we're getting close to being able to add some weathering powders to this and finish it off. Right, so probably the most important thing about a um, oil tanker is actually having the streak of oil staining coming down from the filling point. Now, there's lots of different ways you can do this. You could just go with a gloss black, for example. You could just do it, go with a straight gloss paint or even a satin paint. Just something that gives a difference between the coloration of the flat matte black of the body and the actual color of the oil streak coming down the body. Now, I've got a couple of options here on the table with me today. One is, is called a tensochrome oil color, which is from Life Color. Uh, and the other one I've got is a, a dirty grease effect. Now, I'm actually going to go with the dirty grease effect. Um, because I actually think in terms of the type of material this tank could be carrying, it could be carrying um, oil in one of these rather than petrol, being a black version. Um, but I think actually this dirty grease effect should give us the, the right kind of finish. If it doesn't, I'll take it off again. So it's going to be a nice simple brush application on this. So nothing complicated, no airbrushing, anything like that. Uh, and if we need to soften it, we can use some acrylic thinners just to soften it as well. I think one of the things to remember here as well is this is going to be a still a relatively new vehicle. 
So whilst it will have some staining to it, it's not going to be massively heavy. Spin it round to the side and repeat the process. Now as that's uh, an acrylic paint, it shouldn't take too long for that to dry. We'll get a sense of how the effect's working. Okay, if it's not working, we can change it. We can add different colour paint to it uh, and finish it off. But it's a nice, simple addition to a, a tank wagon. So whilst I've actually got this dirty grease effect paint out as well, uh, I'm actually going to use it on the buffer head as well to simulate the grease that you'd find on buffer heads. This is very much a case of just uh, stiffening it onto the face of the buffers. So with a small amount on the end of the brush, just dab it in the centre of the buffer beam, centre of the buffer head rather, and you've got an instant greasy buffer head finish. I can see already the uh, the grease effect down the side, which is simulating the oil um, running down from the filler point. It's already pretty much dry now anyway, and it's given that really nice difference in colour between the body and the oil staining. I'm going to give it a second pass over it, just give it a little bit more depth as well, a little bit more sheen. And another easily overlooked part of this is adding oil staining around the filler neck itself as well. So don't forget to go in around the top here as well, adding a little bit of staining just from some overspill. Now one of the advantages of going over something like this twice is you get a slightly different effect with a, a second coat, your first coat. So this second coat is expanded a little bit outside the original in some places, which means you'll have some areas where it'll feel a little bit heavier, some areas it'll feel a little bit lighter. Again, very subtle effects, but they all make a little bit of a difference. And as they're moving parts, a little bit of grease around the axle boxes won't do any harm either. Right, so we're down to the finishing touches now for this one. So we've actually been able to process through this tanker quite quickly. Um, they're quite simple vehicles to do really, because you have that kind of general dirty, grimy tanker wagon feel across the main body of them. And then it's that really key feature of that oil stain from the filler point. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use a little bit of the Humbrol smoke weathering powder. And that's just going to be used just to blend together the, the top colours here. Uh, so we've got like the, the cat walk across the top and the, uh, the paint where it's splitting across that joint. Uh, I just want to tidy that up with a little bit of the smoke weathering powder. Again, as before, this is it's very much a small amounts process. I don't want loads and loads of, of powder on this. Just enough to highlight the details. And one of the nice things about these powders as well, they do just highlight some of the streaking in the body side as well. Uh, just adding that little extra touch of interest. Again, don't want to be over the top with this. Don't want loads and loads of powder, just enough to highlight things. A little bit of the smoke along the chassis. It's just going to help to highlight some of the raised detail in the uh, underframe moulding.
And then with this being such a new wagon, in terms of the era we're modeling it for, um, it's not gonna have much rust stains, but it'll have a little bit of frame dirt to it as well. So I'm just using a really tiny amount of the Humbrol Dark Earth color as well. Um, literally the smallest amount I can possibly get on my brush. And all these colors are really doing is they're just highlighting some of the raised detail not really adding a huge amount of color per se there is now an important finishing touch as well because right at the bottom of the tanker is the oil delivery point as well so we're just going to use a spot of the dirty grease effect on that as well just to highlight that delivery point and not forgetting the second side. So that's completed this uh, 45 tonne TTA tanker, which is now ready to go into the layout fleet and put with our bolster wagon and mineral wagon, which we completed earlier. So I'm gonna go and play some trains. <laughs> I have to say, looking at it there, a weathered ATF with a small weathered pickup goods, it just looks the part, doesn't it? I mean, considering that when you buy these models, they look pristine like this, to see them like that, it just, it just brings a model to life, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously we need a, a few more wagons to complete the full freight train, to have a full scale length train behind the ATF, and uh, there's a small matter of some minerals still to do as well. Yes, Mike, I will yeah. get onto them I haven't for forgotten you. about it, don't worry. I'm well, sure you won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but being serious about it, actually, yeah, that the, the 21 ton mineral wagon, um, lovely detail model from a Cura scale, but actually with the weathering on them, I mean, that looks fantastic now. It really does, and this is what I really enjoy about using the powders, the fact that once, you know, you stipple them on and you, you bring the the, like the vertical streaks down with the coal and everything else, 
it just it enhances that detail, not just on the, the body itself, but underneath the frame. Because let's face it, if everything's too pristine, things get missed. But when you can see the detail picked out, you notice everything. Yeah, that's right. I think that's one of the nice things about weathering as well. Is actually, I find particularly with uh, the, like the pure black plastic as it comes to you sometimes that actually it can kind of hide some of the detail. Um, and it's actually, once you've got those subtle layers of colour on them, it just highlights the shadows, the shapes, the details. In some cases, it even highlights the actual engraving that's been done on things like the, the axle springs and things like that as well. Um, so it really does add a lot of detail, not just in terms of making it look realistic, but highlighting all that detail that actually you're paying your money for to get from these models. Well, that's very correct. I mean, I know in the past, whenever I've weathered my locomotives, it's amazing that, number one, they actually look like locomotives. But you are right, you actually start to see the shapes yeah. coming out, whereas with everything just too... Yeah. bright and clean, yeah. you do miss a few things. Yeah, that's right. But look, as, as you can see at home, I mean, we haven't used an airbrush, we haven't done anything that's overly complicated. We have used a few simple techniques with only a few products like the powders, the enamel sprays, and dry brushing as well, which is a tried and tested technique. It's quite a traditional technique. And we have literally come up with a product here that anybody would love to have on their layer and of course we're happy to have one else yeah absolutely yeah and like i said we, we've well we've got quite a few more weather wagons around to, to extend this train and build it up as well it's like i've got the pair of the the war flats as well they look great in this train um, mm. all done with similar techniques a little bit of airbrushing with those as well but most of the deck was done with with handwork as well um world your oyster with weathering and we've got so much more to show you in the rest of this series indeed and i'm looking forward to part two coming up next after this one where we're going to take not just one but two nine f's a crossy boy the 9F and a regular 9F and just make them look, well, different. One of them yeah. sort of slightly weathered and the other one very much weathered. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing how we transform those pristine models into these workhorses that the 9S really were. Absolutely. I'm sure everyone can already guess which one's going to be the dirtiest of those, but we'll leave it to you to guess what they're going to be. I think you've got a good idea, though. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much for watching part one. Make sure you stick around to watch all the other parts. You're going to learn a lot. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot as well. Don't forget, you can buy the powders and everything to do with weathering at our shop, keymodelworld.com forward slash shop. Check it all out, and we look forward to seeing you in part two.